An emergency notice posted on social media says China's Sichuan province plans to add 52,000 quarantine rooms. Residents are panicking as the situation worsens inside Heilongjiang province, which borders between northern China and Russia. A new study to help us better understand the CCP virus, how it's mutating and how it's spread in the early stage. The CCP virus transmission between humans is obvious now, but it wasn't in the early days. Taiwan says it alerted the World Health Organization about it as early as December 31st, but the WHO denies it. But what really happened? The White House criticized Voice of America on Friday for repeating the Chinese regime's propaganda. A former VOA employee talked with us about the struggle to counter Chinese infiltration. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Could there be a second outbreak in China? A document circulating online says one Chinese province plans to convert 52,000 rooms into quarantine spaces. The emergency notice appears to be from the Virus Outbreak Emergency Management Office in Sichuan. It asks different regions to identify hotels, vacation resorts or other places which can be used for quarantine. The document says officials should be proactive and make sure the quarantine centers are ready to accept people for quarantine as soon as the need arises. The letter also comes with attached files assigning quotas for different regions, with 52,000 rooms in total. It also asks officials to submit a count of potential selections to a contact called Huying Feng within two days. The Hong Kong Economic Times reported that a group of Chinese scholars say China is at risk of being decoupled from the rest of the world after the virus epidemic eases. They said the CCP virus pandemic may change the world's power structure and China should be prepared for challenges greater than the threat brought by the virus. Scholars say Chinese media produced large amounts of disinformation which misled many Chinese citizens and Western countries. Propaganda saying viruses originated from the U.S. and that the world should thank China damaged China's image. Scholars also concluded, quote, whether China will be isolated by the world isn't up to the Western countries but ourselves. On April 10th, the Chinese Ministry of Civil Affairs offered a temporary subsidy to people in need. According to state media CCTV, around 255 billion U.S. dollars has been allocated for 61 million people. That works out at around 6 U.S. dollars per person per month. In Hubei, the hardest hit province, each resident will get 17 dollars per month. After hearing the news, one netizen said it's like cracking one egg into the Yangtze River and then telling the whole country to drink the egg soup. (laughs) Videos circulating online show a policeman firing a shot into the air. According to Radio Free Asia, the people in the video are small merchants at a wholesale fruit market in Sichuan province. They are protesting against the market overcharging them. Other similar videos are circulating online, showing business owners all over China demanding financial support from the government. The epidemic has seriously impacted the country's economy. Data shows nearly half a million businesses closed down in the first quarter of 2020. Inside Heilongjiang province, there's another situation developing at the border between Russia and China. Our reporter Xi Wenrong has more. Russia is sending Chinese citizens back to China, among them likely people carrying the virus. While some return voluntarily, others are forced by the Russian government. Many Chinese citizens believe the regime has the situation under control. Until April 9th, the border city Suifenhe reported a total of 151 imported confirmed cases from Russia. On April 7th, both China and Russia closed their shared border. Official reports say since March 21st, more than 2,000 people have crossed the border from Russia into Heilongjiang province. A resident told us on April 8th that at present there are still Chinese citizens stranded at the border. He added that people who have crossed the border into China will be quarantined and that even if they are not infected, they're more likely to get the virus in an environment like that. 
The city of Sui Fun He is too small and doesn't have many places where you can go into isolation. Some people stay in the stadium and there are others at major hotels. Maybe you don't carry the virus yourself, but you don't know who among those coming back with you are infected. After you've been in a densely populated space, it's easy to get infected. A video circulating online shows one such stadium with people lying on the floor. As the epidemic continues to worsen, many residents are panicking. Restricted access. Only one person can be sent out per family to shop every three days to buy something. Anyone who goes to work should carry a certificate from the community and their company to let them enter and exit. Now the communities are basically closed and people do not go out. Of course, there is some panic. Chinese state-run media says the border city has been building a makeshift hospital since April 6th and it is expected to be in operation by April 11th, providing more than 600 beds. Reporting by Shu Wenrong, NTD News. The CCP virus transmission between humans is obvious now, but it wasn't in the early days. Taiwan says it alerted the World Health Organization about it as early as December 31st, but the WHO denies it. But what really happened? On Saturday, Taiwan officials publicized a letter it had sent to the World Health Organization. Why? To prove that as early as December 31st last year, the country tried to sound the alarm, warning the organization about human-to-human -human transmission of the virus. That at least seven typical pneumonia cases were reported in Wuhan, China. The letter explained that Chinese health officials told the media it wasn't SARS, an infectious disease that killed hundreds in the early 2000s. It added that the patients were being treated in isolation. And the cases have been isolated for treatment. The organization said the email didn't mention human-to-human -human transmission, but Taiwan's health minister called the distinction playing word games. Taiwan's health minister says any medical professional would know isolation implies human-to-human -human transmission. That's professionals acting like amateurs. If being treated in isolation is not a warning, then what is? On Saturday, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesman defended the WHO, saying the organization released authoritative information at the earliest time possible based on China's confirmation of human-to-human -human transmission. The Chinese regime didn't confirm human-to-human -human transmission of the virus until January 20th, but reports show that authorities knew about it well before that date. Currently, Taiwan is barred from WHO membership due to pressure from the Chinese communist regime. But the Trump administration recently criticized the agency, saying it missed the call on the pandemic and chose politics over public health. President Trump has now threatened to withhold funding from the organization. Thanks to its early action, Taiwan has so far been successful in controlling the virus. It currently has less than 400 confirmed cases and six deaths as of Saturday. 127 European politicians are calling for Taiwan to be admitted to the World Health Organization amid the global pandemic. That's according to a statement by the country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Saturday. 67 members of the European Parliament sent a joint letter to the EU on the 8th, and 60 members from the German Parliament sent a letter to the WHO on the 2nd. All 127 praised the way Taiwan handled the pandemic. Anita Schaefer, member of the Bundestag, wrote she can't understand how Taiwan has been left out, calling it a matter of life and death. Many are wondering about a vaccine. Professor of vaccinology at Oxford University Sarah Gilbert told the Times a vaccine could be ready as early as September, and she's 80 percent confident it will work. Experts say vaccines typically take years to develop. Many estimating one for the coronavirus will take at least 12 to 18 months. But Gilbert says her team is one of the most advanced in Britain, adding human trials could start in the next two weeks. Other countries, including the U.S. and Israel, are also reporting progress. Israelis saying it could have one available for use within 90 days. A new study to help us better understand the CCP virus and its global spread. NTD's Catherine Wen has the details. A new study by European researchers found three different types of the CCP virus spreading around the world. Microbiologist Sean Lin 
says this further confirmed scientists' belief that the virus is constantly mutating. First, the SARS-CoV-2 virus did mutate uh, aggressively in human body in different regions. Secondly, the virus may undergo further adaptation when it encounter different races in different continents. Based on virus genomes from the earliest cases, the report traced the family tree of the virus from December to March across the world. Among the three types found, A, B, and C, the most common found in the U.S. was the original virus, type A. Wuhan, the original epicenter, was mainly hit with type B, an early mutation of type A. And type C, daughter of B, got into Europe via Singapore. Lin says this research also proves all cases linked to Wuhan. This uh, report clearly suggesting that uh, all these cases can be tracked back to Wuhan, China, and the Chinese uh, communist regimes claiming or blaming the United States or Italian as a source of or the origin of the outbreak. Uh, those kind of claims are totally groundless. Mount Sinai conducted another study, published this week. It suggests the virus in New York was brought there by people arriving from Europe. It also shows a case of the virus in Washington state came from Wuhan, which agrees with the study mentioned earlier. Reporting by Catherine Wynn, NTD News. The White House on Friday criticized Voice of America for repeating the Chinese regime's propaganda. A former employee of VOA talked with us about the struggle to counter Chinese infiltration. In a newsletter on Friday, the White House criticized a video published by news organization Voice of America on Twitter. The video shows Wuhan, China celebrating the end of a two-month lockdown with a light show. But the eye-catching scene isn't the full picture. Residents told us life in Wuhan is extremely difficult and that people are fearful of a second outbreak. It's not easy for us to survive now. We have almost no income. The prices are all so high. The price of vegetable is at least five times higher than before. Hundreds of Wuhan business owners went out to protest because their businesses cannot survive, only to have authorities crack down on the gathering. The White House also criticized VOA for taking China's reported death toll as the truth and for comparing it with U.S. data. VOA is founded by American taxpayers, but the administration says the outlet too often speaks for Americans' adversaries, including China. In a statement, VOA director Amanda Bennett says the outlet is free to show all sides of an issue and is actually mandated to do so by law. She also listed out the stories they published that challenged the Chinese regime's narratives. But a former VOA employee told NTD that she often felt pressure by management to include the Chinese regime's voice in her reporting. Gong Xiaoxia is a former Mandarin service chief at VOA. She was fired from the position after interviewing billionaire Guo Wengui, who is wanted in Beijing, about the extensive corruption within the Chinese Communist Party. The 2017 live interview was abruptly cut off in the middle. VOA says the decision was based on journalistic standards. For example, in commentary programs, the management often stressed that we have to let pro-Beijing people talk and let the two sides debate. This is not how you do things. Doesn't the Chinese government already have plenty of places to speak? Why should you give them more of your space to speak? Last night, I received phone calls from former colleagues in several different language services at VOA, including Chinese service, English service. They're all very happy. They told me that the White House has finally spoken up because they have been tolerating this for so long. She said balanced reporting does not equal repeating misinformation without context. Freedom of press does not mean you boost the momentum of a totalitarian government or repeat their propaganda. If you do so without providing any context, then you are basically misleading the public. VOA was founded by the U.S. government during World War II. The International Service reports in multiple languages, including Chinese, and often serves independent information to countries with no freedom of press. But some say that has started to change. According to a BBC report, many Chinese pro-democracy netizens were angered after Guo Wengui's interview was cut off. They accused VOA of being infiltrated by Chinese regime's agents. Gong said over a third of VOA's Mandarin service staff members are Chinese nationals. She said some are often threatened by the Chinese regime when they go back to China. Penny Zhou, NTD News. 
And to date, the United States has surpassed Italy's number of deaths by the CCP virus. But counting for population, the death rate is actually far lower than that of Italy, which now has the second highest recorded number of deaths. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the death toll. On Saturday, the number of deaths from the CCP virus surpassed Italy's, nearly 20,000. But deaths per capita in the U.S. are far, far lower. In the United States, about six in every 100,000 people have died from the virus. In Italy, about 32. On Friday, Dr. Burks from the Coronavirus Task Force gave credit to healthcare workers for keeping that number low. As the president noted, our mortality in the United States is significantly less than many of the other countries when you correct them for our population. And that is really solely the work of our health, our frontline health care providers. President Trump also said they're expecting the final death toll to be far less than earlier projections showed. Country, So we'll see what it ends up being, but it looks like we're headed to a number substantially below the 100,000. That would be the low mark. As of Saturday, the number of infections in the U.S. is over 519,000, but Dr. Burke said the epidemic curve looks like it's starting to level off for the first time. In light of the good news, the task force has given much credit to Americans for following social distancing orders. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. New York State is still seeing a plateau in the hospitalizations and less people are being incubated. Governor Cuomo says it's a good sign. But the New York City mayor announced the city schools will stay closed for the rest of the year. Here's the most recent update from NTD's Molina Wise Cup. New York may have reached the peak of the chaos. Governor Andrew Cuomo said the hospitalization rate is down. Even though there are still people getting infected and going to the hospital, it's less than before. All the numbers uh, are on the downward slope. He called the decreasing number of intubations a hopeful sign, since people who are intubated are more likely to die. Yesterday, 783 people passed away from the CCP virus. Cuomo said it's unfortunate to still have such a high death toll, but noted that at least the number is stabilizing. And to protect New York City students, Mayor Bill de Blasio is keeping schools closed for the rest of the year. The decision comes after a conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci, who supported the action. The risk did not outweigh the reward. He says students returning for only a few weeks wouldn't be effective, and that a rushed return wouldn't allow much time to properly clean schools. And the state, once asking for health care volunteers, is now asking for lawyer volunteers. The New York State court system and uh, our chief judge is going to organize lawyers statewide to do pro bono legal assistance. It's to help people with housing issues or accessing government programs, since he says officials still aren't sure when the state will be able to fully reopen. Melina Weiskup in TD News, New York. As the state's death total now reaches 8,600, Cuomo says the message from this year's Holy Week may be more precious now than ever before. And with funeral homes being overfilled, some nursing homes in Paris are forced to keep the corpses of deceased virus patients. A look at the number of cases and deaths in different countries around the world. France reported 600 new deaths in the past 24 hours. Russia's death toll remains relatively low at just over 100. This as the country is also fighting other issues. With Paris funeral homes swamped after a wave of virus deaths, bodies have been left to decompose in nursing homes. A spokesman confirmed that the number of deaths has risen to more than 21 in just one nursing home alone. In Moscow, dozens of ambulances lined up outside a hospital as they waited to drop off virus patients. One ambulance driver said he had stood idle for 15 hours to drop off a patient. And in order to prevent such a scenario, a city in eastern Russia is now using jet engines to spray disinfectant onto the streets. With Italy's death toll reaching almost 20,000, police are enforcing strict lockdown measures this Easter weekend. On Saturday, the only people seen in a park in Rome were policemen on horseback. And in Asia, the South Korean government decided last month that everyone arriving in the country after April 1st must self-quarantine for two weeks. Unfortunately, not everyone has respected the decision. Now the government will use electronic wristbands to monitor people who have been caught breaching the rule. And now we get to know Dr. Federico De Luca, an Italian medic that was infected with the CCP virus. 
Dr. Federico De Luca is a 44-year-old geriatrician from Milan. He usually spends his time treating elderly people in a residential care home. Unfortunately, the father of seven has now been taken care of himself after he was infected with a deadly virus. The virus hit him hard, forcing him to spend three weeks in intensive care, unconscious and connected to machines. But now he's able to sit upright again and tell the story of how the illness affected him. At first, he was aware that he may have contracted the disease when he developed a slight temperature, but he wasn't sure where he had picked it up. He wasn't prepared for how quickly the virus would take hold of his body. It was on the second day when the sickness really set in. It was like I was falling out of control. It was like the ground just opened up under my feet and I was falling vertically toward the disease. De Luca lives on the second floor and has no elevator. On the second day of his infection, he described being unable to walk down the stairs on his own. When the ambulance arrived, they had to move him with a stretcher. It was a condition, let's say, of a continuous fall. My condition worsened so much that even my mind was unable to process the problem. If it had happened a week before, maybe my mind could have understood what was happening, but instead, my condition worsened so quickly that I was put on an oxygen mask and and I was brought in as a red coat to the hospital of Sariate. Fortunately, Dr. De Luca is now recovering. He no longer gasps for air and can almost breathe normally again. He says that before falling ill, his life was mostly divided between his work and family. He adds that he hopes to return home soon to his loved ones. The White House confirming today an aid package for Italy. 30,000 U.S. troops stationed there will be mobilized to build field hospitals and transport supplies. The U.S. will also send equipment to help fight the virus. The Trump administration says it's preparing a robust aid package for virus-stricken Italy. The country is one of the worst hit, with almost 20,000 deaths. The help comes at the request of the Italian prime minister and will include equipment and supplies. Italy hosts around 30,000 U.S. military personnel. They will be mobilized to build field hospitals, treat non-virus patients, and transport supplies and food. NGOs, including faith-based organizations, which are already involved in the relief effort, will also be supported. Trump says the three goals of the package are, one, lessening the risk of reinfection from Europe into the United States, two, maintaining critical supply chains and helping the Italian economy, and three, demonstrating United States leadership in the face of Chinese communist and Russian disinformation campaigns. The Chinese communist regime has been trying to position itself as a global savior during the crisis, but its help for Italy has been called into question. What the Chinese regime said was a donation of medical supplies turned out to be a multi-million dollar sale. Not only that, what Italy received was its own equipment donated to China at the height of its crisis. The U.S. Justice Department saying earlier this week the Chinese regime is using the pandemic to promote communism over Western liberal democracy. A group of scientists in Finland have created a virtual simulation showing that coughs are considerably more effective at helping diseases travel than people think. This 3D model provides insight into the trajectory of a person's cough. In the supermarket setting in which this model is based on, the particles of a cough can rise to over 9 feet into the air. The spread of the particles then move from one aisle to another. The model also reveals that a cough can stay in the air for up to 6 minutes. A scheme to tackle loneliness amongst elderly care home residents has gone viral amid the coronavirus lockdown, with thousands of virtual volunteers signing up to adopt a grandparent. Liliana, well, that's a nice name. At this care home, elderly residents are staying social while social distancing. They are using a virtual adopt-a-grandparent scheme that's helping to combat lockdown loneliness amongst its seniors. Volunteers can now chat online with care home residents as face-to-face -face visitors are banned due to UK social distancing measures. More than 62,000 people registered to take part in the initiative, organised by care group CHD Living, within just days of the launch. Among the volunteers is five-year-old Freya from Gloucestershire, who has been matched with 74-year-old Sheila Warfield, a resident at a care home in Surrey. This has cut me off from everything, this virus, because... I've got two little nieces that live in Hazelmere and they used to come regularly to see me but they can't come now, you see, so I don't see any children, <laughs> let alone grown-ups. More than 30 residents at Sheila's home now have access to a Facebook portal device, as do the other 12 care homes the group runs in the south of England. 
Michelle Hustle volunteered to join the scheme after putting her business on hold for the lockdown. And I think it goes both ways, keeping them company as well as keeping you company. And it just lifts, you know, everyone's spirits and it's a healthy and safe way to to be able to bond and communicate with people who might not have another outlet. CHD Living is now hoping to share those volunteers with partner organizations. Here at China In Focus, we bring you first-hand information from inside China. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates.